So welcome to this lecture on VHDL in the course Digital System Design with PLDs and FPGAs. Uh, in the last lecture we have looked at basically how to write packages um, basically uh, to write components in a package and put it in a library and instantiate it in, in a some top level entity. Also we have looked at uh, the configuration specification and configuration declaration which talks essentially about um, uh, how to um, say like you are instantiating some components uh, from a library. Uh, so the configuration specification bind this instantiation to a specific library, specific package, specific entity and specific architecture that is a basic idea. And configuration declaration does this thing uh, in a separate design unit. Also it has an additional function suppose the top level entity has multiple architectures it tells which architecture to be used uh, for that configuration specified. So uh, depending on how you write configuration um, uh, even the top level entity can have multiple architectures that is the basic idea because when we at the beginning of the, uh, the lecture we have discussed that the VHDL can have multiple architectures but we did not say how the tools are going to infer uh, which architecture you require okay. So this can this can happen uh, in two scenario one scenario is that you have a one entity and multiple architecture and uh, you want to use at the time of synthesizing or simulating um, or implementing whatever may be the case uh, that a particular act architecture suppose you have an entity with uh, three architectures and you are just going to use that entity alone that component alone and you want to say out of the three which architecture to be used for the current um, uh, compilation okay. So that is uh, done by the configuration declaration in addition uh, suppose in your entity you are instantiating components from library and you can specifically say a particular component should come from a particular library otherwise you will be at the mercy of the tool uh, because there could be um, similarly named components in various packages and various libraries and if you just say some library name and use that library dot package and various maybe you will write some 5 use clauses. So the tool will pick whichever comes first to suppose you have used a component called counter the tool is going to look at the, the first, first package, second package and so on wherever it finds a name which is matching the instantiation and uh, the, the arguments of like uh, various ports you have the uh, you know you have the data type and if the data type matches it will pick up uh, that particular component probably that is not the one you want uh, then uh, in that case you can very specifically say a particular component instantiation you can go to the level of uh, specifying a particular label suppose you have used XOR gate 5 times uh, like suppose the labels were X1, X2, X3, X4, X5 these component instantiation labels and you can say for X1 it has to come from a particular package and for X2 maybe from another package and so on. So uh, it is very it can be very uh, specific very detailed. So that is what we have seen in the last uh, lecture. So let us quickly look at the, the slides of the last uh, lecture uh, for a revision. Um, so uh, we have taken a, an example of a double synchronizer as, as a top level entity and a flip flop as a component and we have seen that in the normal course you will write the code for the flip flop. So the library entity and the architecture and in the same file or in the same project you will have the uh, double synchronized uh, circuit the top level entity uh, which has you know the, the input 
and the clock and the output and you declare the component uh, which is this particular data flip flop uh, declare the signal to interconnect because you have it will have to declare this uh, declare this internal signal instantiate it twice and connect all the signals and that is what we have done declare the component declare, declare the signal the first flip flop is instantiated with appropriate mapping second one that is it. But when you write a okay, this is a bit about the package and library the hierarchy is that library multiple libraries within each library you can have multiple packages and within package uh, within a package you can have components, functions, procedures and data types. And there are predefined library one is SGD which contains these two packages standard package and textio package. This is what uh, which contains uh, the bit binary uh, the real all those definition and all the operators uh, related to it. And the text IO is used for file operation which can be used in test benches. And the work library is the one which your current design whatever you write is compiled into the work library. And normally it is understood that without these two uh, no tool can work. So, you do not uh, kind of explicitly uh, declare uh, these like libraries std comma work is not required, required it is implicit it is understood. Similarly uh, the essential package in this standard library is standard. So, you do not have to say use std dot standard dot all this is implicit this is assumed it is there and but uh, if you have to use a text io uh, in the std library that is not implicitly declared because it is not uh, used often it is used only in the text test benches and so when you want to use it um, you have to say use std.textio.all and this is how we write the, the package. Uh, so, the top you write a package header follow that with the entity and architecture and we are calling our component the same component DFF. So, at the bottom you have a library entity and architecture of D flip flop and at the top you have a package header package some name is N package within that you write the component of this DFF uh, exactly same as the component declaration in the in the top level entity which is nothing but uh, this entity uh, whatever is inside the entity is repeated there and that is it. Once you do that uh, this particular component is, is uh, the package uh, definition is over and this can be put in a particular library and that is tool. Uh, specific vendor specific how to compile a package into a library you have to refer to the manual uh, or the user guide of the, the tools you use. Uh, but when we uh, go for a demo uh, we can definitely see that at least uh, the package uh, the, the, the tool we are going to use uh, how to use that within that tool we will see. Um, so, how, how to use this the, the, the fact that you have put a component in a package and compiled into a library, but we have to see how it is to be used in a top level entity in our case this double synchronizer. So, first thing is uh, to note that we have put that package in a particular library. So, you have to add the library close library xy lib that is where we have assumed we put this xy package and you have to say use xylib dot xy package dot all then comes the entity. But in the architecture declaration region we do not have the component declaration because now that is part of uh, the, the package or part of the component which, which is in the library. So, we do not have that we just declare the internal signal which is required and then we uh, instantiate as uh, previously. Uh, the this particular component that is all what is required. And as I said um, uh, you can have multiple component in a package there is does not matter suppose you have 10 components um, you can include the 
component declarations uh, all the component declarations within the package body and follow uh, it up uh, uh, with the entity and architecture of all the components okay. Suppose you have 10 components uh, write the entity and architecture of the first component followed with the second component and so on you can write that in a single file uh, compile it into library uh, that is simple uh, as it is and definitely when when you instantiate you can use positional association or named association uh, this is any time better better than this particular thing where you have to keep uh, we have to remember the order of the formal parameters which is uh, sometime difficult to uh, know and moreover when you write a component one would like it to be generic because uh, if you have a counter then you should not be worried about 8 bit counter, 16 bit counter and so on. You should have a counter uh, which is generic uh, in size and when you instantiate it you should be able to specify the size we have seen that and uh, how we do is that instead of hard coding the, the size we define a constant called generic is nothing but a constant say here it is called size and we say size is 4 we say size minus 1 down to 0. So uh, the syntax is that in the entity declaration you include generic and open the parenthesis and within that you can write any number of generic depending on the requirement. Say here we require only a size but in the case of a FIFO we have discussed maybe you have a uh, data width and uh, the size of the FIFO in terms of locations and so on. So here size is declared as an integer with a default value of 4. This is the default value when you instantiate if you do not specify anything then it is treated as 4 okay. So and definitely for a 4 bit vector we need we have 3 down to 0. So we say size minus 1 down to 0 and we have a signal. So wherever uh, required uh, the size is required and then you say size minus 1 down to 0 then follow it up with the, the architecture and at the top you have a component declaration which is nothing but uh, similar to the entity. So all these appears uh, at the component side then you can put it into a library uh, but uh, then we have to see how to use that okay how to specify uh, the size we require uh, when you instantiate it. So that is what is shown here. Uh, in the normal case if you say count that is the counter we have put port map and the input signal output signal um, the width will be 4 but you want a specific width. So like ports are mapped we have to say generics are mapped. So the count generic map and 8 and there is only one um, generic here so that gets the value 8. So everything uh, here is 7 down to 0 now okay. So you get an 8 bit counter and if there are multiple generics then you have to say comma like here you can say comma 16 and so on and this is nothing but positional association you can have a kind of um, named association which say size that is what it say here size and with the forward arrow. 8 you can say then if there are multiple generic then you put a comma and the next one and so on okay. Um, and this is the normal port map so you can have any number of parameters and we have seen an example of a NAND gate with uh, propagation delay TPLH and TPHL uh, defined and we have seen that the, the, the behavior is uh, specified like O1 gets I1 NAND2 after TPLH plus TPHL by 2 okay. And we have also seen that when you instantiate a particular component in a top level entity the um, top level entities generic can be passed down to the, uh, the component which is instantiated okay. Example we have treated was a counter which is a generic counter which is instantiated in a generic timer. So naturally the width of the timer will be width of the counter. So 
when you instantiate the counter in the top level entity of the timer and top level uh, architecture of the timer then instead of hard coding it we say the, the generic of the timer T width. So, when that is ultimately specified you know it is going to be uh, you know instantiated or specified uh, then like the timer can be instantiated in a CPU then that will be specified at that time and that will be passed down to the counter. So, that is the generic in, in hierarchy and this is a configuration specification which tells how to bind the instantiated components to entity architecture pair and this is specified in the architecture declaration region. Configuration declaration has the two purposes one is the same purpose bind the components to a particular library also the it binds the top level entity of this particular um, top level design to a particular architecture it has okay. And this is a separate unit this is hierarchical okay we will see what is the meaning of that. And we have seen an example a full adder with 2 XOR gate, 3 AND gates and 2 OR gates. So, uh, you know the component declaration is XOR AND and OR and we have in the architecture statement region we have instantiated this. But in the declaration region you can say uh, for X1, X2 that those are the labels of X or 2 instantiation that it comes from use entity library dot package here there is no package but because it is in the work library. So, the entity and the architecture okay. For A3 that means in the AND gate A3 alone use entity uh, this library this entity this architecture and whatever the formal ports which is uh, in the library is mapped to something called A1 just a name change um, in case you have used a different name here okay. We have not used we have used a positional association so probably this does not matter. But um, suppose you have said instead of HSB suppose here we write say for A3 we say instead of saying HSB map to S4 suppose you had said um, kind of A1 map to S4 then this could be done to change it. And there are two special syntax for all OR2 that means for all the instantiation of OR2 use a particular uh, entity architecture pair. And you say for others that means here you see uh, AND gate instantiation for particular A3 we have used a particular uh, component from a library for all others that means A1 and A2 use something from elsewhere that is uh, the way it is specified. And when it comes to configuration declaration um, for a simple binding of the entity top level entity to architecture you write a configuration name of the entity you say for, for a particular architecture name N4 that means this entity is mapped to this particular thing that is all. But um, you want to specify the component binding that can be done inside. So, you say for A1, A2, A3 use a particular AND gate and say N4 for others O2 N4 that means we are not specifying anything. For all XO2 use configuration work dot XOR con that means the XO2 has a configuration as part of its entity architecture which say that which are the uh, where this particular thing should come from and which is architecture to use all that. So, that shows the hierarchy of the configuration. So, I think this is what we have started briefly uh, in the last classes. So, uh, there are different packages and different packages as different operators functions and it can be little confusing at the beginning um, which particular operator to use which particular function to use and so on. So, we will look at and uh, it is very difficult uh, maybe it is not given in a textbook sometime and uh, one way to know um, uh, this particular operators definition is is by looking into the libraries okay that would mean 
that you go through the the source code of the library okay that is a uh, very cumbersome thing because you have to open uh, the source of the library in VHDL or very long uh, you know go through all the code um, and in the process you make some changes to it and then if you compile it for uh, some tool simulator tool then it can give errors and all that. So, I am giving you a, a brief about the various packages, various operators and functions. So, the primary package we have come across other than the standard package is the standard logic 1164 where uh, this standard u logic is defined with all the 9 values we have seen that ok. And a standard logic is nothing but a standard u logic, but it is going through a resolution function in the case of multiple drivers. And we have a standard logic vector, standard u logic vector and standard logic vector which is defined as an a unconstrained array of standard u logic and standard logic uh, respectively. Uh, so, it, it can take um, any value of uh, you know 2 raise 32 ok. And when we declare we constrain it by specifying the size and standard logic 1164 contains only the logical operators for this particular standard u logic, standard logic, standard u logic vector and standard logic vector. So, uh, if you want uh, to do some arithmetic with it then uh, we need to use a different package this contains only the logical operators. So, please keep that in mind. So, the next thing we have already seen in some example which is the package standard logic unsigned uh, this is also the an IEEE um, package. So, it is written IEEE dot standard logic unsigned it has standard logic and standard logic vector as a data type. The operators like plus minus multiplication division is overloaded for it. Uh, also it has relational operators all greater than e equal to not equal to less than less than or equal to greater than or equal to all that is there. So, you can the moment you say use IEEE standard logic unsigned you can use all these. In addition it has shift operators which is called SHR which is shift right and SHL which is shift left ok. Mind you this is all logical shift there is no uh, arithmetic shift which is offered in this particular um, library. So, if you are working with two's complement maybe it is um, little difficult either you will not be able to use uh, this particular operator you may have to write code for arithmetic shift ok. And um, as I said uh, the digital um, I mean design when you design uh, through the VHDL uh, it enforces strict type checking. So, suppose you have a standard logic vector uh, which has to be converted to integer then you have to specifically convert it to integer it will not be you cannot assign a standard logic vector to an integer. Maybe it is 8 bit, but you know that the 8 bit goes from 0 to 255 for unsigned, but that like you cannot assign that to an integer unless you convert standard logic vector to an integer. So, this is this particular function convert uh, this standard logic vector to integer. You can say conf underscore integer open the bracket and whichever is your standard logic vector uh, you know the object you can put here and it will return an integer you know that is how this is uh, this particular function to be used. And uh, there is a synopsis uh, specified library which is called std underscore logic underscore arith ok. Now that does not use a standard logic vector as a base uh, vector type it has two arrays of standard logic which is unconstrained. One is called unsigned other is called signed. As this name suggests that can be used for arithmetic you have you can have unsigned addition and signed addition 
Um, it is exactly similar to standard logic vector, but then the name is unsigned and the name is signed here. So, you have uh, this package as all the operators overloaded for unsigned and signed. So, you have all the arithmetic operators, all the relational operators like in the previous case you have like standard logic unsigned you have SHR and SHL. But if the, the type you are using is unsigned then it is a logical shift if it is a signed uh, data type you are using then uh, this will be an arithmetic uh, shift automatically. So, you do not have to worry. So, if you play with the two's complement number then this can be uh, very useful because you do some uh, kind of computation uh, with the sign extension then you have to shift it properly with the, the sign bit otherwise the value will not be correct the result will not be correct. So, this is taken care of in this SHR and SHL the provided use the proper data type signed. So, it also has conversion function. So, basically it has conversion function from standard logic vector unsigned, signed and integer. So, there are 4 uh, conversion functions. So, the convert integer uh, will convert from all the other 3 like standard logic vector signed and unsigned to the integer. So, you just open the bracket and write whatever. So, that means this convert integer is overloaded 3 times in this case for, for standard logic vector for unsigned and signed. Similarly, you have convert unsigned which will convert from standard logic vector signed and integer. Convert signed, convert standard logic vector and all that ok. So, that means it means that it convert to standard logic vector convert to integer from these 3 types. Uh, whatever is not mentioned here is the is the from uh, uh, kind of data data type. Now, uh, if you want to use this um, libraries synopsis libraries, you say uh, library IEEE use IEEE standard logic one one six four because the standard logic base type itself is defined here. Then you say standard logic arith wherein you can use um, kind of uh, all the arithmetic relation shift and uh, logical operators and uh, sorry um, functions and you say at the end I to please standard logic unsigned because the, the shift operators uh, unsigned has um, yeah there are arithmetic and shift and uh, all that operators here and mind you this is put uh, below this so that uh, main operators are from the arith. So, these are the recommendation uh, for all the design you have to use standard logic arith and unsigned you can use it for counters and test benches and uh, do not use a package there is a package called std logic signed do not use it. Um, now like um, there is a package from IEEE standard uh, like in place of the synopsis packages. So, these two are synopsis packages arith and uh, sorry arith is a synopsis package. So, there is another uh, similar package from the IEEE. Uh, so, that is called numeric underscore std or we call numeric standard. Similar to arith you have unsigned and signed uh, uh, specify as array of standard logic and you have arithmetic operators. Now, you not only you have plus minus multiply and division you have absolute rum and mode you have. In the numeric standard you have relational operators, you have logical operators, you have shift operations you know have shift left, shift right, rotate left, rotate right, right SLL, SRL which is nothing but this ROL. ROR which is nothing but this. So, exactly same and you have conversion function to integer to unsigned signed from uh, like if you take two integer it is from unsigned or signed or standard logic vector and uh, similarly others. And uh, how to use 
uh, this particular package. So, you say library IEEE, library uh, use IEEE dot standard logic 1164.org that is required because standard logic is defined there and use IEEE dot numeric standard dot org ok. So, that is how uh, the IEEE numeric standard library is used. Uh, in the earlier case uh, we have seen that we have to use 1164 unsigned and arith, but here is only uh, numeric standard need to be used. So, that is um, the various libraries, various packages, uh, operators and functions. Now, when it comes to type conversion uh, many a times you have to do because we use different libraries and so you have to move between some time standard logic vector to signed and unsigned and integer and so on. So, there are three ways you can convert. So, it is automatic between base type and subtype ok. So, so suppose you have a, uh, a, a subtype then you do not worry uh, you have defined um, a subtype of something then you do not have to worry you just assign it will work it is automatic you do not have to do the type conversion. Um, in some cases um, you have to use the explicit conversion function like to integer convert integer and so on. Maybe say you have to convert from standard logic vector to an integer. So, you can use uh, either of this um, functions and uh, you know that um, the sign unsigned and standard logic vector all are the, the unconstrained array of standard logic. So, essentially though the diff name is different uh, the data type is same it is only the name difference. So, uh, the VHDL allows you to do a type casting as in C. So, when you convert between uh, these three uh, between any two of them then you can just use a type casting say suppose you have a standard logic vector called SL vect and you want to assign this unsigned vector USG vect to this. You do not do a you do not have to call two standard logic vector or two standard logic or convert standard logic just say STD logic vector open bracket and just write the USG vector you get the standard logic vector. And similarly suppose you have a USG unsigned vector and you want to uh, assign a standard logic vector you just say unsigned uh, then you give this standard logic vector as an argument then unsigned vector will get it. And particularly suppose you want to use some numerical value for whatever purpose and say you want to pass uh, this as sign number then you just say signed um, uh, you know in the code you give that numerical value of the standard logic vector uh, it will be automatically converted to, to the signed uh, data type ok. So, that is about uh, do the type, type conversion between um, uh, the various um, similar data types. Now, um, you should be careful when we write when we call a function say suppose in some case we needed a standard logic vector to be converted to an integer ok. Uh, so, we will call a function which convert uh, the standard logic to an integer ok. And if you know that suppose you have a 4 bit binary number to convert to an integer the algorithm is that uh, just simple you know you iterate through the binary number bit wise wherever there is 1 you say uh, the you have an accumulator you say that accumulator is nothing but accumulator plus 2 raised to i, i is the current index of that bit position ok. So, if you have 1010, so it is basically 2 raised to 8 um, plus sorry 2 raised to 3 plus 2 raised to 1 which is 10 ok. So, uh, and that you go through an iteration like for i in 0 to 3 uh, then if i is 1 then uh, some variable is accumulated variable is variable plus 2 raised to i and so on ok. So, that is how it is computed, but like 
do you should not think that this is going to be synthesized into a hardware ok. Um, uh, the data type checking is enforced by the uh, the VHDL as a language ok. So, the fact that we write some code to convert a data type that should not be synthesized into a circuit ok. So, basically that you should understand and so there are attributes uh, which say like a, when you write a library function for this type conversion there are some uh, like attributes which is inserted uh, so that the synthesis tool will not uh, synthesize that part of the code that you should understand. So, that is what is um, uh, written here, um, but um, having said that uh, sometime when you convert uh, suppose uh, take an example of memory ok and uh, suppose you have an uh, a memory with 8 bit address ok and so the number of locations are 256 it will be normally address from 0 to 255 ok. Now like in VHDL code you can specify an array of location indexed by the address ok. So, you will have a memory array which goes from 0 to 255. So, when you suppose you are reading a memory location you would put the output of that particular memory location to a data bus and you need to specify the array index. So, to that extent we will kind of convert the address which is in standard logic vector to an integer and supply this as an index to the array ok. Now, um, though the type conversion does not imply any hardware, but there is a hardware here which is hidden that means you are converting. Um, an index which is in standard logic vector to an integer which is indexing an array ok. Uh, then that represent a an address decoder because you know that in a memory a particular location is accessed by an address decoder. You specify the address a particular decoder will go and select a particular location and uh, so that uh, like implicitly. Uh, sometime this uh, the type conversion not the type conversion alone, but the fact that that converted integer is indexed into a, an array uh, can represent a uh, address decoder. I, I may be what I have written is little uh, kind of misleading. Uh, it is not the type conversion which implies an address decoder. The fact that that converted number is is used as an index into array can uh, mean that it is an address decoder. So, that is what I want to convey. Uh, so, I hope uh, you are kind of clear about this, uh, this particular type conversion. So, let us see some examples uh, of arithmetic ok, maybe some kind of uh, at, at least at the start this will bring in clarity. Suppose um, you imagine there are a, b uh, these are the input kind of vectors 8 bit vectors which is defined as unsigned 7 down to 0. S is we are going to assign some output unsigned 7 down to 0. Uh, this is all these a, b, s are 8 bit and we have an 9 bit s which is called s 9 which is unsigned 8 down to 0 and we also have an S7 which is unsigned 6 down to 0 ok. Now very simple addition suppose we are kind of doing an addition uh, or you are implementing an adder then the simple addition is that you say S get A plus B ok. Now A is 8 bit, B is 8 bit and S is also 8 bit and which normally in a digital course you would have learned that you add 2 8 bits and you end up with a 9 bit. But when you work with the operator you add a and b and you just end up with in um, kind of 8 bit result the carry is ignored um, when it is uh, synthesized or implemented. 
but in some case you you in like when we suppose you are doing a multiplication we are trying to design a multiplier then you know that in the multiplier algorithm you need to add the partial products and therein and then you have a shifting. So, there if you add 2 8 bit that will result in a 9 bit and we require the 9 bit ok in that case maybe in a simple addition uh, we may not require uh, the carry bit, but there are cases where we require the carry bit in such a case what we do is that say see how we can get that uh, 9 bit. So, S 9 is a 9 bit vector which is assigned then we append 0 at the most as a most significant bit of A. So, you say 0 concatenate with the A which is 8 bit plus 0 concatenate with B. So, if there is a carry from the MSP which is 7 down 7 A 7 or B 7 position then that goes to the 8th position and you get a 9 bit result ok. Uh, suppose you want to live with only the 8 bit result then you can definitely say uh, like sorry a 7 bit result then you can say a 6 down to 0 plus b 6 down to 0. Suppose you want to uh, you have a larger input and you have a smaller output then you pick up uh, the same size um, as, uh, as the output then you will get uh, there is no issue because this is 7 down to 0 which is 8 bit, but S7 is only 7, 7 bits so wide. So, you use A6 down to 0 plus B6 down to 0 and some cases you may need to supply a carry in ok. Maybe you have split the order for whatever reason into two stages the carry out of the previous stage come as a carry in of the next stage. In such a case we do the opposite of appending 0 at the MSP position. What we do is that this is a 9 bit result and A and 1 at the uh, the least significant bit plus B and the carry input ok. So, you get uh, the S 9 ok 9 bit result, but this part should not be part of the address uh, sorry part of the result ok because which say that suppose uh, we are not interested in in having the sum output we want to push some carry if it is generated to the next the first stage. So, here you know we have made it 1. So, if the carry in is 0 then the, the carry out from the first stage is 0, but if it is 1 then 1 plus 1 is 0 the carry into the, to the second stage is 1. So, but this one output the sum output itself at the least significant bit is not what we require. So, we ignore it. So, ultimately you just take the the up to the, the first bit from the 8th bit and cast it to an 8 bit result ok. That is how we use the carry in uh, if required. So, this shows how to use a carry out this shows how to use the, the carry in uh, with the standard operators and we have used. So, you do not have to write a ripple adder code or the carry looker adder code normally you can stick with this plus and in the case of FPGA there are dedicated resources to implement the plus. So, which is very kind of um, high performance area efficient and so on. We will see that when we go to the, uh, uh, the, the, the particular uh, FPGA lectures and um, that so that is about the arithmetic with uh, kind of addition uh, with uh, the carry out with carry in and so on. So, now we let us look at arithmetic with time the you know that time is specified as kind of integer units. So, you say 1 nanosecond 2 nanosecond you do not say 1.5 nanosecond. So, but uh, when you do some at least for simulation wise when you do some calculation uh, like you want to calculate the period and you want to multiply the period with something then uh, you may end up in a in a kind of um, real numbers. So, it will be good if you can convert the time to a real number. So, suppose here I am showing that we declare a variable which is named period which is of type real 
and now we say period get real that is a type casting and time data which is in nanosecond say 100 nanosecond divide by 1 nanosecond. So, we remove the unit and you get a 100 and that is casted as a real and then you get the period in real then you can multiply uh, divide then you get the, the real number as a result. So, that is how we do the arithmetic with time. So, uh, briefly we have looked at the packages um, basically the IEEE uh, standard logic 1164 package st uh, standard logic unsigned which is IEEE library uh, a synopsis package called standard logic arith how to use that various arithmetic operators, relational operators, logical operators, shift operators and conversion function and we have seen numeric standard how to use that. We also said the type conversion is not a kind of does not represent a hardware it is just for the language uh, type checking. But when we in special cases when we convert and use it for indexing an array it can represent some decoder that should be uh, should not be forgotten. And ultimately we have seen some example of arithmetic uh, like some similar size result as the input when you add and when you have a carry input what to do when you have a carry output how to get the result of the wider result with the carry out and so on. And we have ultimately seen the time some computation using the time during simulation where we convert the time unit into the real number so that you can multiply where you end up with the fractions then that can be uh, preserved if you convert to the real number. So, let us uh, talk about this particular topic and uh, which is called delay modeling how the VHDL model the delay we have already seen the syntax we say that something get after 5 nanosecond then there is a delay uh, for that output uh, to, 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 to display uh, or to come out uh, with a 5 nanosecond delay. So, there are two types of uh, delay specified in the VHDL one is called inertial delay and another is called transport delay. So, basically inertial delay will model the delay through capacitive networks so you know that you have a line with capacitance you apply some uh, binary value then that capacitor has to charge up to that particular uh, value. And before that before it getting fully charged uh, if the input applied is removed then there would not be any effect. So, that is what is inertial delay and that works for uh, the gates with threshold because you, you have an inverter and you apply a 1 at the input of the inverter. And then naturally the uh, there is a capacitance on the line and the input has to charge up. Uh, say previously it was 0 above the threshold for the output to start appearing ok. So, there is like at the input there is some certain pulse width um, uh, then only like uh, a minimum pulse width then only the input will go above the threshold and the output will appear ok. And also there is a propagation delay. So, inertial delay has two parts one is a minimum pulse width. Uh, which is required for the output to, to come ok. Suppose uh, once again suppose you have a uh, inverter with a 5 nanosecond delay and if you apply a 1 nanosecond pulse at the input of the inverter uh, for sure uh, you can you can be sure that it will not make any uh, effect at the output it will not appear at the output because the propagation delay was 5 nanosecond and you apply a narrow pulse of 1 nanosecond. So, it will not appear ok. But we are not in a position to say that you appear you up apply a 4.5 nanosecond pulse whether it will appear at the output ok that, that we are not able to say. Uh, at the gate level we have no great way to predict this by simulation or anything like that. Uh, but if you consider the equivalent transistor layout and do like suppose you have made an AND gate or an inverter using uh, say take an inverter with a PMOS transistor and NMOS transistor. 
do the layout do the place and route of a VLSI chip and do a spy simulation then you will be able to see the exact effect. But when we model this at the, the gate level uh, we do not have such accuracies ok. So, it is at a very gross level we are going to model and it has limitation you should understand that there are certain limitation with regard to this kind of modeling and that can be reflected there will be side effect uh, if you are careful in simulation you will see uh, the effect of this in certain cases uh, depending on particular model uh, used to represent the delay in the VHDL output code particularly for simulation timing simulation and so on. So, uh, it has two parameters one is the minimum pulse width uh, required for the output to appear second is the propagation delay itself ok. So, we will see so that is the inertial delay. So, we will see the inertial delay and move on to the uh, to the transport delay. So, let us look at the inertial delay uh, this index for it is that say x gets a after 5 nanosecond ok. That means um, the meaning of it is that uh, between x and a there is a 5 nanosecond delay. Also it means that anything less than 5 nanosecond anything less than 5 nanosecond uh, suppose you apply uh, to a will not appear at the x ok that is meaning of it. But uh, exactly same if you say x is inertial a after 5 nanosecond it is same as uh, like a after 5 nanosecond because the default delay is inertial. So, whether you say a after 5 nanosecond or inertial a after 5 nanosecond does not matter. But in this case the minimum pulse width is 5 nanosecond. But suppose you have a case where the pulse width required for the output to appear is 3 nanosecond and the propagation delay is 5 nanosecond uh, which probably may not be true like it may be very close to 5 nanosecond. But take this case then you can specify you can decouple the minimum pulse width and the propagation delay and the syntax for that is you say reject 3 nanosecond inertial a after 5 nanosecond ok. So, it means that um, anything below 3 nanosecond will be rejected and anything above 5, 3 nanosecond will be delayed by 5 nanosecond. Also you can say that u gets say 1 after 5 nanosecond. 0 after 8 nanosecond 1 after 12 nanosecond it means that you uh, uh, will get a signal for a first 5 nanosecond 1 next 3 nanosecond because here we are here we are saying the real time ok real. Uh, so, for first 5 nanosecond will be 1 next 3 nanosecond it will be 0 and the next 4 nanosecond it will be 1. So, this is a very useful uh, kind of syntax to generate some waveform and particularly this is useful in test badges. Um, so, that is about the, uh, the inertial delay and transport delay is the delay through a transmission line ok. Basically no pulse is rejected you know you have a long line of bus ok and you apply a pulse irrespective of the width of the pulse it is going to go to the other end with a delay ok. But it will not be rejected because the pulse width is some kind of less than something and way to specify the transport delay is uh, you say z is transport a after 5 nanosecond ok. You say instead of inertial you say transport a after 5 nanosecond then you get uh, the transport delay. Uh, so, maybe uh, I will show some examples uh, the waveform and some kind of um, cases where the uh, this delay modeling is used for verification. Uh, but just uh, for today we will wind up at this part we have told about delay modeling which is inertial delay and transport delay. Inertial delay a kind of model uh, uh, the delay through capacitive networks or delay of a gate with a threshold which essentially means that you need some minimum pulse width at the input for the output to appear due to this threshold crossing and the propagation delay. 
and at the uh, as i said again at the digital gate level we have um, kind of gross delay we, we can't be ac accurate but if you take a vlsi transistor level implementation do the spice you will know the exact delay but this is very useful um, at least uh, where such like from the spy simulation such delays are known then we can if knowing the device characteristics you can model uh, using this index reasonably correctly because it, it allows you to specify the minimum pulse width and propagation delay. So we have seen the syntax for that uh, default is inertial so we have in the simple case when you say a after 5 nanosecond or inertial a after 5 nanosecond the propagation delay and the minimum pulse width is same. When it is different use a reject clause and you can generate waveform, waveform by specifying uh, you know the, the various values using this syntax and the transport delay model the delay through a transmission line wherein there is no reject uh, like there is no minimum pulse width requirement and the syntax for is that uh, z you know some output get transport a after 5 nanosecond okay as I said in the in the next lecture we will see some kind of um, an example of the syntax with the waveforms and we will also see uh, maybe how to use this delay modeling to, to verify some timing um, uh, of a flip flop we will see that and then we will go through some maybe the VHDL code examples uh, in the next lecture so that you are familiar uh, you get some good familiarity with the, the VHDL language. So I stop here uh, please revise and uh, do not take it lightly it, just because it is a language because it represent the hardware you have to get into the habit of thinking hardware uh, than just uh, treat it as a language. So I wish you all the best and thank you.